Hello, and welcome back to the Outdoor Minimalist Podcast. I'm your host, Meg Carney, and I'm an outdoor and environmental writer and author of the book, Outdoor Minimalist, Voice Less Hiking, Camping, and Backpacking. Follow the link in the description to pre-order a copy of the book so you'll be the first to receive it on the date of September 1st, 2022. The Outdoor Minimalist Podcast has a goal to give listeners actionable ways to waste less hiking, camping, backpacking, and more during every step of their process. Your impact outdoors starts long before you hit the trail and goes beyond leave no trace ethics. You'll learn how to identify sustainable outdoor brands, how to ask hard questions regarding sustainability, and begin to shift and evolve your mindset to integrate minimalism into all of your outdoor pursuits. In this episode of the Outdoor Minimalist Podcast, we will be discussing the use or lack thereof, of natural fibers in the outdoor industry. If you tuned into episode three, then you'll know that we discussed a little bit about natural fibers versus synthetic fibers and their use pending the application. So if you haven't listened to that episode, it may be a good starting point when we are tackling this topic. Since it's impossible to discuss all of the issues and developments in the textile industry in one 45-minute episode, I'll likely be discussing different aspects regarding textiles in future episodes as well. If you have a specific question about textiles, materials used, or processes in the textile industry, especially within the outdoor industry, I'd love to know them. I'm only one person, so knowing your ideas, questions, and insights is extremely helpful when I'm crafting upcoming content. I want to hear what you want to hear, so write a review, send me a DM on Instagram, or even send me an email. Just let me know and I'll do my best to tackle those questions in some way. Okay, so what's the deal with natural fibers in the outdoor industry? Why don't we use them more if they're a more sustainable option? Why are they more expensive and harder to design? Are synthetics really that bad for the environment? Are certain natural fibers more eco-friendly than others? (laughs) There's so many questions that I have when it comes to natural fibers and their application. And to help me answer some of those questions, I'd like to introduce John Gage. John Gage is the co-founder of the Appalachian Gear Company, a brand that pioneered performance fabrics made from 100% alpaca fiber geared towards outdoor adventure activities. John has spent his career in textile manufacturing and is also a lifelong outdoor enthusiast. Appalachian Gear Company was founded with a simple goal in mind, to create a performance product line using natural fibers that gives customers an eco-friendly alternative to polyester and nylon while bringing manufacturing jobs back to the United States. So welcome to the Outdoor Minimalist Podcast, John. I'm stoked to have you on the show and to learn a little bit more about your experience in textiles and the Appalachian Gear Company. But before we kind of dive right in, I would love for you to share a little bit more about your general experience in the outdoor industry, some outdoor sports that you maybe love, and how the Appalachian Gear Company got started. So thanks, Megan, for having me. So my background, my personal background in the outside industry is that I've, I've always loved the outdoors always been a camper and a backpacker and I played a lot of team sports too but I just really have always been drawn to mountains and trails. I didn't do a whole lot of backpacking when I started started having a family and uh, so there were some some years in my 20s early 30s when I was really not doing much and I was working in the textile career but then when I've got two sons and when they became uh, early teens we started backpacking together and so then we did a lot of backpacking uh, over the years and also professionally uh, my degree is in textiles and I've spent my entire career in the textile industry and uh, a lot of that time has been spent dealing with a lot of the big brands that everybody's heard of brands that made team sport products and outdoor sport products and and all types of uh, leisure and fashion apparel Um, So I've been lucky that I've seen the manufacturing end of a lot of this for a long time. I've got a partner, uh, Mike Hawkins. We've been business partners for 30 years. So what happened with with Appalachian Gear Company, which is specifically uh, focused on making outdoor apparel out of alpaca fiber, is that when I started backpacking again with my sons, we were wearing a lot of wool because I'm a believer in natural fibers and I didn't like wearing polyester shirts or nylon shirts. And I became aware of alpaca somewhere around 2007 or eight. And I started to study the fiber. And it took a number of years before the light bulb went on and I thought to myself, why can't I make an alpaca t-shirt? 
and why can't I make alpaca fleece? And so that got in my mind and I just, I couldn't get away from it. And so finally uh, I talked my partner into, uh, at that time we were not in the textile industry. We had started another business. The textile industry, as everybody knows, pretty well left the United States in the early 2000s. But we set a goal of trying to develop a process to make 100% alpaca fiber performance fabric, which had never been done. And it's a really an in-depth discussion that might not be suitable for this podcast because it's a lot of information. But there weren't any previous methods to make what we wanted to make. And it's not the same process that you use for wool, even though alpaca and wool are similar fibers and they're both animal fibers. So anyway, that's kind of the genesis. My whole career has been in textiles. I've always been interested in textile manufacturing and manufacturing in general. And I've always loved the outdoors. And so that really uh, is is how everything came together with Appalachian Gear Company. That's awesome. And that's part of the reason why I thought you'd be a good fit for this specific episode on the podcast, because you do have so much experience in textiles and can kind of shed some light on different processes and different materials and kind of why natural fibers aren't necessarily the number one go-to material for a lot of outdoors people. So I think that would be a good place to start is kind of talking about why you as an outdoors person and then with the Appalachian Gear Company shifted away from synthetics like polyester or nylon blends. Um, what are other ones? Spandex, I yeah, guess. Yes, spandex. Correct. Spandex is in a lot of products. Uh, nylon, polyester, the high density, the ultra high density polyethylenes like Dyneema and Spectra, they just have inundated the market. And I'll back up. I don't want to get too far down into a hole, but the one thing I'd like to mention really quick is that nylon and polyester both were only invented in the World War II era. I think nylon was in the 30s, and it was invented as a replacement for silk. Parachutes used to be made from silk. Polyester was invented in the 1940s. It's a relatively new invention. What's interesting is that the proliferation of synthetics in this industry are what has caused so much of the concern in our industry specifically and it's created some fairly significant environmental issues and so i talk about natural fibers as a replacement for synthetics a lot and i've written about it one thing i like to point out to people is that i don't believe that synthetic fibers in and of themselves are evil or bad to use it's just that if you think about where I came from, both textiles and as an outdoor lover, what's happened in the last 20, 25 years is we have been offered less and less and less of a choice to buy products that are made with natural fiber. The proliferation of synthetics has just ramped up to an incredible amount. As a matter of fact, worldwide right now, between 60 and 65 percent of all apparel is synthetic. And that's a huge amount. And and so that's that's not just the outside industry. That's fashion, outside industry, medical, the whole thing. And so what you, the, the question is, well, why can't you just wear cotton? So most people that are experienced in any type of adventure activity understands that cotton is problematic because it doesn't have any insulation properties. It can put you in dangerous situations. I spent a lot of years affiliated with the Boy Scouts, and so I was taking scouts out camping multiple times a year. And to this day, they laugh at me because I would always tell everybody they can't bring their cotton hoodies uh, because we're going up to Roan Mountain and it's going to be cold and it's going to be wet. So that became kind of an inside joke. But interestingly, so so synthetic fibers really have two properties that set them apart, Uh, two properties that are important to consumers. Number one, they're strong fibers. And number two, they're very resilient. They have a lot of stretch and stretch and recovery. A third feature is that they're cheap. So, you know, consumers may or may not benefit from that because, as we all know, you can buy sleeping bags that are massively expensive and jackets and all kinds of things. So just because the fibers are super cheap, it doesn't translate into super cheap products for consumers. But what natural fibers are good for the outdoors? Well, it just so happens that the animal fibers, which I call protein fibers because they're made from protein, they're awesome for the outdoors. And merino wool took center stage, I think back during the 90s. And decades before that, it was hard to produce lightweight wool because it was really itchy and it shrunk really badly. 
And so the technology wasn't there to make the types of things that we see today. Some technology came along that allowed wool companies to use the, the fine grade wool fiber, like the merino wool, and to make it into shirts and pullovers and underwear and things like that, socks that wouldn't shrink when you washed it. And so since the 90s, there has been that option and wool is a very high performing product. I would say head to head, wool fibers and alpaca fibers are weaker than polyester and nylon, but wool and alpaca both have performance features that are far and away better than nylon and polyester because out in the in the back country, polyester and nylon do not insulate you at all. Just forget about the environmental issues for right now, but you know, wool and alpaca and other animal fibers have this really awesome performance capability that they they keep you warm when they're wet. That's huge because all of us that like to be in the mountains know that you can get weather, wet weather in all the mountains every month of the year. And you can also get cool weather. Uh, you know, we're always asked, well, why would you wear merino wool in July? Well, go out to the Wind River Range, go up to Vermont, up to the Green Mountains in July, and you'll find out why you need something like wool or alpaca. So you can make garments out of these natural fibers that give you better performance than polyester and nylon. Where we are today is that polyester and nylon are so cheap to make, and the vast majority of those products are made in the Far East, and they're made in facilities that are just producing millions and millions of pounds. So the bottom line is, it's easy. It's, it's easy for these big brands to make these products and just keep pushing these products out in the public. It's much harder and much more expensive to try to make interesting products out of natural fibers that actually work in the outdoors. Are wool and alpaca the best for natural fibers, or at least for clothing, for like outdoor use, you think? I would say so. I would say, you know, merino wool worldwide has probably always will have the volume position because there are so many more uh, merino sheep being raised. But as far as the two fibers, uh, yes, I would say they are probably the highest performing natural fibers. I'll talk about cotton again in a minute and we can touch on hemp and we can touch on some of the nat the uh, cellulosics like, like uh, tincel or rayon. It's interesting with alpaca. So wool and alpaca have been used for uh, millennia for clothing. You know, alpaca fiber down in, in South America has been around for thousands of years and their economies were, were tied up with alpaca. And you can still find alpaca clothing today in architectural digs that's a thousand years old. I mean, this the animal fibers are very durable and they're very tough and they are very, very high performing. When I was in South America, I did like, find a lot of alpaca-based clothing, which I thought was interesting because it's not something you see a lot in the United States. But I guess merino wool does seem to have just, it's been around longer than this like performance alpaca material that you have. So it's probably more of a niche following at this point, but it could, it could grow right. into a larger widespread industry usage of this alpaca because it is comparable to wool. Yeah, we're already seeing more companies offer alpaca products, although what we see mostly are alpaca products blended with polyester or nylon. I see that a lot with a lot of natural fibers, and that was a big issue in like, I want to say like 2010 or something, there was a big issue with rayon being advertised as strictly bamboo when it was yeah. a blend, and I think that a lot of companies are still advertising that it is a natural material, even though it's a blend, even if it's only like five percent of the synthetic but then it makes it not a natural material and then i suppose it probably can't be processed in the same way in its afterlife yeah and I'll t it's a, it's a little frustrating from our end because i see more and more advertisements that say alpaca whatever or merino wool whatever and because of my background, I always dig down into the fiber blend. And some of the wool products that are marketed as merino wool are like 38 or 40 percent wool. So they're really a synthetic product that has some wool blended into it. You know, most of the alpaca products I see on, on social media and on the web will have anywhere from 50 percent alpaca to maybe 60, 65 percent. But there's a reason for, for that. So specifically in the alpaca industry, it's it's been primarily geared towards handmade products and craft kind of products. So hand knitted gloves and hats and shawls and um, even sweaters that have the fluffy yarns. A lot of people are familiar with alpaca that kind of has that fluffy look to it. And 
that type of fabric is not suitable for outdoor activities. And we were told early on when we started to reach out to contacts in the industry, you couldn't produce alpaca the way we wanted to. And it just turns out alpaca is kind of a crazy fiber to work with. And so the bottom line is the, the types of industrialized processes like we use geared towards producing higher volume of a fabrics that have more performance features like durability and stretch and recovery. It just hadn't been made yet. With merino wool, you've got a little bit of a different story. So if you think about, just think about Europe a few hundred years ago, there's been a wool market for hundreds of years. And so there's a lot more industrial experience in dealing with merino wool. So think of worsted wool suits and you know wool socks and the old rag wool sweaters. So industrial processes built around wool have been around a lot longer than alpaca. Alpaca has largely been more of a craft-based business. And so one of the things that, that I did in the formative stages of this, of this company is I did a ton of research and there was literally nothing written about how to produce products I wanted to produce. So we had to come up with it from scratch, which was really frustrating and really fun. I know those things don't sound like they would go together, but when you're an entrepreneur, you're broke most of the time and you don't know what the answers are most of the time. But just, I would say it's like going on a, a backpacking trip with no map and no starting point, no ending point. It's just like you have to start going down this path to figure it out. It was almost like going back to school all over again. We learn new things every day and we still do, which is really interesting. I guess one question I do have about the alpaca material is why did you choose making that over just using a wool product in the first place? Well, it was a challenge. And it had never been done. And from a business standpoint, I really wanted to, and I say, when I say I, I mean myself and my, and my business partner, Mike, we felt like there was unfinished business when the entire apparel industry left the United States. Uh, I've told people in the past, I literally would dream about walking back into our, we, we had an operation before. We, we designed and built a dye house back in the early 90s. We had between 50 and 90 employees, depending on the, the year you're talking about. And it all went away because all our customers went away. They all went overseas. And so this thing just never went away. And so the answer is two things. Number one, we never gave up on the fact that you can actually have an American-made, a competitive American-made apparel company. It was like we can't go to the end of our careers and not give this another try. And then the other thing is when you're a small business, there's just a lot of merino wool out there. And do people really need one more choice of merino wool t-shirt or pullover? And we figured if we were going to make a go of being a brand, because we our original business plan was that we were going to make this stuff and we were going to sell it via e-commerce. And so the second part was we had to stick out. We had to have a unique product and we had to have a product that really worked. And we had to have a product that was different than everything out there because we're not rich people. And, you know, a lot of times if you have the money to market something, then you can kind of overcome a lot of these issues. But with us, uh, we just, we basically went for broke. We decided we're going to start a textile company and we're going to have a unique product or else we're not doing it at all. And so it's, it's really that simple. Yeah. From the business standpoint, that makes a lot of sense. And I've kind of seen that with other small brands, I guess, that are up and coming. Their approach is much different than what consumers are used to seeing. And so it does kind of help them stand out and stick in your mind when you are thinking of replacing a shirt or getting a new one or any type of material, really. But without getting like too deep into how alpaca materials are made. I do want to talk a little bit about some of the other natural fibers that you mentioned and kind of how they compare to synthetics and also the differences between the plant fibers and then the protein fibers that you're talking about. Right. So cotton, we'll start with cotton. Cotton is a great fiber. I wear a lot of cotton. Everybody loves cotton t shirt Problem with cotton is that it will absorb 100% of its weight in moisture before it drips. And so I'm not going to beat that idea because everybody knows that, that cotton uh, is problematic in outdoor scenarios. And cotton can mildew. It doesn't dry fast. It's decently strong. We all know that if you have cotton duck fabric or canvas fabric, it's it's durable. Uh but moving on to other cellulosics, so if you if you think about rayon, rayon is a, a cellulosic fiber. Cotton, any any fiber made from a plant material is called a cellulosic fiber because cellulose is the base material. All animal fibers are protein fibers because protein is the base material. 
so rayon is actually a sustainable material and it comes from trees. Trees are turned into pulp and various constituents like lignans are taken out and then the cellulose is reconstituted into a fiber. Rayon has some issues. It's, it's a, a very nice fashion fiber, but it gets weaker when it's wet. But there's another fiber that's similar to rayon. It's called Tencel, T-E-N-C-E-L. And it's uh, made by a company by the name of Lensing Fibers. And Tencel is also made from wood cellulose. It's made in a closed loop process, so it's more environmentally friendly. Rayon is not the most environmentally friendly process. Both of those fibers are sustainable, so um, Tencel is sustainable. But Tencel has some interesting properties. So Tencel gets a little bit stronger when it's wet. Tencel is very lustrous and a very silky soft fiber. And it's got decent strength. In fact, I believe I believe tin cell fibers and maybe even cotton fibers, if you if you check the fibers, are maybe even a little bit stronger than alpaca and wool, believe it or not. But tin cell is a fiber that also uh, it absorbs water and it breathes well, but it doesn't really absorb and hold water the way cotton does. And so I think it has some potential uses in our market. Now, also we you hear of like bamboo and. The tricky thing here is that often bamboo is actually made with the rayon process. And so bamboo is is uh, chemically melted down, for lack of a better way to explain it. And then the cellulose reconstituted. It's, it's not like they're taking bamboo and then beating the hell out of it and taking the fibers out. So a lot of times if you, if you feel a bamboo shirt and a rayon shirt, they feel just about the same. And chemically, they're exactly the same. And a lot of times the process is exactly the same. Yeah, and from my understanding of rayon, which is pretty surface level, is just that it's not necessarily the most environmentally friendly material because of the processing releases a lot of toxins. That's correct. So rayon, difference between rayon and tin cell, aside from some of the fiber differences, tin cell is a closed loop process, which is significantly more environmentally friendly. It doesn't have the Effluent. So closed loop means they are reusing a lot of their production constituents. Rayon is a process that has a significant amount of liquid effluent that in the past has been problematic for streams and lakes and things like that. So they, they use some pretty powerful chemicals to melt down the wood. And the results of those chemicals create COD, which stands for chemical oxygen demand in water, and BOD, which stands for biological oxygen demand. Those technical terms simply mean that when you put these non-natural things into streams and lakes, those things take up oxygen that living organisms need to live on. Uh, so it's not like the constituents are poisoning. Sometimes they do, depending on what the constituent is. And I'm not saying that rayon puts poisons in, but generally, so a biological oxygen, oxygen demand would be that a substance takes oxygen that organisms normally need to break down natural or organic materials. Whereas chemical oxygen demand means that there's a chemical that goes in the water that binds up the oxygen in the water in a chemical process because they come in contact with each other. And so that oxygen is not available for natural organisms in the spring, in the streams and lakes. So that's why rayon is more problematic. So is it relatively similar to where we see maybe like an ocean dead zone or toxic algae blooms where that's kind of removing the oxygen from the area? Yes. Okay. That, and that a lot of times that those effluents are not just textile effluents. Those are from urban areas, mm -hmm. massive manufacturing plants, that kind of thing. Correct. It seems like there are a lot of natural fiber options for clothing, especially like Tencel. I've seen that pop up more for outdoor clothing, like you're saying. And then Merino wool, which I've used for a long time, even though I am vegan. So that's like a different conversation. But using those animal fibers sometimes like outweighs the other sustainability factors, I think. So why do you think we aren't using more natural fibers in the outdoor industry? And why are we using so many blends instead of just that strictly that fiber itself? That's two very good questions. And I've got a question for you. I'm interested in your statement about merino wool versus you being vegan because obviously, and you know that, so the merino wool is a sheared product. So is it being in contact with the animal? And I'm interested for my own benefit because I talk to all kinds of people 
Yeah, so that concept, it, it depends because um, people use veganism in so many different ways, but a lot of times that's boiled down to just the animals you consume. But if you are if you are an ethical vegan, which I would say I am, then you don't use any type of animal materials in your life. So that would include things like beeswax and uh, leather and wool. But a lot of the merino wool that I have, I've gotten secondhand and I don't buy right. it like right off the shelf. And so that's kind of how I like maybe just it, but I know there's a lot of vegans that wouldn't agree with me doing that. No, nah, that's a great answer, and I appreciate that. It's it's uh I actually haven't considered it like that before, and so I appreciate that. Uh, and I would say so so if you and I were going to actually debate this, I would just say to consider one important thing. So if you wore all synthetic fibers, all synthetic fibers, if you go far enough downstream, they're all a result of oil exploration and oil and gas industry. Oil and gas produce two, after you produce all the gas and the oil and the solvents, uh, you have a couple of other chemicals that are very important, and it's called ethylene oxide and propylene oxide. And those two chemicals go into most all of the polymers that you've ever heard of. So polyethylene is also known as polyethylene terephthalate which is also known as polyester. Those polymers are start with ethylene units and ethylene starts from ethylene oxide. So as a vegan, so you would also be, I'm sure an animal lover, you know, all of us are, or most of us are, I'd say. Some people are evil, I guess. But you know what happens, the, the more plastic fibers that we consume, the more animals die globally and mostly because of ocean pollution, you know, we're reading about microfiber, uh, microplastics and microplastics are washed off of clothes and they wear off of clothes. And all of the research now is showing that a lot of us have microfibers actually in our bloodstream and uh, it's in the ecosystem. And then you have these awful things that happen like aquatic organisms, fish, turtles that have the six pack rings around their necks and that kind of thing. So with the animal fibers, you're not really based on the oil and gas industry and the byproduct of animal fibers and cellulosic fibers for that matter is 100% biodegradable. Whereas nylon and polyester take anywhere from a couple of decades to two or 300 years to degrade. That brings up another thing that's kind of frustrating for me to see is that you're now seeing some products that say biodegradable polyester. Which isn't even a real statement. Like that's no, impossible. It's, fru <laughs> it's frustrating. And it, well, there are some polyesters out there that are compostable. Mm -hmm. But when the marketing says biodegradable, then the average person thinks, well, okay, great. So the microfiber that falls off of this is just going to decompose naturally. Well, no, it does not. Those products only decompose when you put them in a composting situation or a landfill situation without the presence of oxygen. So it has to be a kind of an anaerobic breakdown. And so again, it's, you know, marketing, there are a lot of misrepresented marketing statements in our industry these days, I'm afraid. And it's frustrating for me because I spend a lot of time at festivals just talking to people about textiles because the industry's been gone so long, people don't really have a knowledge of what's happening and they don't understand these terms. But then you asked, why are people blending synthetics into uh, animal fibers? And so, mm -hmm. and that's mostly Merino because Merino is where the volume is. On the alpaca side, there are just not that many companies that are producing alpaca, but all of them except for us are using the blends. And so this is my opinion. You might have some textile engineers and researchers that are smarter than me that want to email you and say that I was wrong. But the bottom line is, in my experience, when you have the merino wool products that get far enough under 180 grams per square meter as a fabric weight, then you start having durability issues. It's hard to knit those fabrics, hard to finish those fabrics because they pop holes in them very easily. And sometimes some of these fabrics get down as low as 130, 150 grams per square meter because they're so lightweight. And what happens is that people are blending nylon or poly to be able to more easily and more efficiently process these fabrics and so that they have the durability once they get into the finished product. And so our design characteristic uh, when we started was that we're not putting synthetics in our product. And our whole design process was centered around that. And, and we haven't had a problem making our products without it. But We've got a patent pending process too, so we went about it a little bit of a different way. But it's it's primarily for strength. That's why people blend into 
animal fibers. Okay. I mean, I guess that makes sense. That's kind of what I was guessing is it was more of like a durability to make it more comparable to the straight up synthetics. But as like a final question for you, I think I am wondering if it is possible to start and shift the like textile, since they're kind of re-entering being made in the United States by a lot of companies, is it possible to shift it more towards natural fibers, whether it be animal or plants? Yes, absolutely. Matter of fact, we are starting to look at going down the R&D path with some of these other natural fibers. So some cellulose, uh, I'm really interested in hemp, by the way. I'm really interested in tencel. And not because, not to augment our current products, but as a small company, you know, we, you have to continually reinvent yourself. And then just look at our hoodie. It became really popular and it still, it surprises me every day. It's such a cool thing when we drop inventory and it just sells out. And sometimes I ask people, why why is everybody buying these hoodies? (laughs) You know, and I'm, I'm proud of them and we've worked really hard on it, but it's almost, it catches you by surprise. So, but the bottom line is we have to keep developing more product. So, I'm going to look at these other fibers because I'm convinced that I can create blends with alpaca and other natural fibers for specific products that will have where the blend will give you that way overused corporate term synergy. It is a great term because when you put two things together and it gives you something more than the two separate things, that's the whole purpose of it. And that's what we always look at. I'm really high on hemp, maybe pun intended, <laughs> but uh, but hemp is such an awesome fiber and we're way far behind because it was illegal here for so long. Yeah. And some other countries in the world are growing hemp that yields finer fibers. And so in this country with the medicinal and uh, recreational cannabis, and then you have the CBD, and then you just have the hemp that's being grown for its fiber, they're kind of three different plants. So in other words, if you're growing something that's really going to concentrate on flowering, it's not going to really be concentrating on fiber. And if you're growing something that's going to concentrate on fiber, it's not really going to be in the hemp world. It's not going to be concentrating on the the flower. Yeah. So sourcing is maybe a bit of an issue if people want to make hemp materials in the United States. Right now, I think that's the case, but I think it's going to come around and I'm really optimistic about it because based on my research, there are some hemp strains that yield much finer fibers that you can use in what I would call top weights, like shirts and things like that. You know, hemp is, it's strong as all get out. It's not as soft as cotton, but it's really good against abrasion. You know, they used to make ship ropes out of it. And so I think it would be a really great fiber. And for the wool people, I think it would be a great replacement for nylon. Because still, if if you want to make wool fabrics that are super lightweight, you got to probably blend something in it. And hemp would be a great thing to blend in it. Tencel is another good one. I think the folks... Uh, at lensing are probably looking at how to get into other markets because you know it, it's primarily been a fashion mm-hmm. fiber but it has some really great properties and so I'm sure I'm giving all my the big brand competition some ideas they're probably scrambling around and googling tinsel right now but I think there's a place for it in the outside industry and I think it's better than cotton uh, one for one but you know also when you put it in as a blend you could possibly get that synergy you know and the result is such an incredible improvement over what happens in the environment. And, um, I mean, we, we, you talk about the processing of polyester and nylon is the fact that it requires oil and gas. But really, the, the microplastic thing, I don't know about you, but really, I really didn't even start hearing about it until we started producing alpaca products. I was really the front end of polyester and nylon, being the oil and gas derivative was the thing I was focused on. All of a sudden, I started reading these articles and, and, and studying research on microplastics, and it's, it's really scary. I mean, they've measured it coming down in uh, precipitation in Colorado. It's crazy. That's another reason. So one of your questions is, what about recycled poly? And yeah, I thought about talking about that, but I it's like an entire episode on itself. So you could always return for another episode and we can talk just about yeah. recycled polyester because it's a huge topic. Because I think it's a step, but it certainly is not the answer. And I don't really pay any attention to it. I just don't think it's... I have a lot of issues with I it. I do too. <laughs> I'm with you. I have a lot of issues with it. I'm going to kind of wrap things up a little bit here. And I guess the word on the street is that you you guys are thinking of manufacturing in the United States. Is that correct? Oh, we already do. Oh, you do? Okay. That's good. Yeah. From the very beginning. Uh, so that was the other thing is our whole goal was to, to... When I say bring manufacturing back to the United States, it wasn't to bring Appalachian gear back to the mm-hmm. United States. It was okay. to bring 
to bring textiles back. So our company started in Charlotte, North Carolina. The only thing that we import is the alpaca fiber. And that's because you can't get the grade of fiber and yarn that we need from the United States yet because the United States is still based a kind of a home craft market. It's not large enough or industrialized enough to give us our base material. But in our own plant, we bring the yarn in and then we manufacture our own fabric. And the big news is that we haven't really announced but so you get the scoop is that we are getting ready to be totally vertically integrated which means that we start with the, uh, a raw material which is which is the yarn but we produce it into a fabric in our own operation we design our own process it's our own machinery and our product team and then as a final step we're going to sew our own garments so right now we outsource the sewing and we'll continue outsourcing yeah so and we also outsource to other companies in, in North Carolina. So no part of our manufacturing process is outsourced to another country. And I believe we'll be the only apparel brand in the outside industry that's vertically integrated. Now, you can throw up all the brand names and say, well, what about these guys and those guys? But really what they're doing is other people make all their stuff for them. And their, their vendors may be vertically integrated, but you know we are our own brand. For us to have to control every piece of the process is going to be huge. And it's also something that hasn't been done for decades and decades. And we're super small, but we're doing it. And, you know, we have the skill to do it. We have the knowledge to do it. And we thought, why set up an office and phone and then outsource this to somebody else? So it's a, a real source of pride for us. And the people that we're hiring, we're teaching the process. You really can't find people that know how to do this kind of thing. So that's another it's a really fun thing about our jobs is teaching people new skills. And since we don't have commercial customers, our, our customers are the consumers, we don't have big companies yelling at us every week that we have to get this big order out so our employees have to work on the weekend. We don't work on the weekend at all. So we're trying to create this situation where we make everything and our work schedule is great. We provide insurance. We pay great, and it's you know we're hopefully we can keep that whole thing going. Yeah, and those types of sustainable, sustainable and ethical practices are what we need to see more of in a local practice, like you're explaining. Yeah, well, I was, I was going to say I would like to point out to so people that listen to the podcast that maybe have not heard of us before, but we also we don't use any plastic in our fulfillment. We roll all of our products in craft paper and we put them in craft boxes and the boxes and the paper we buy are also recycled. We roll our fabric on tubes, cardboard tubes. So that's how we transport it through our plant and we recycle all of our tubes. We have not bought a single tube in four years. And what we do is we go around to some of these other fabric companies and cut and sew companies and we pick up the tubes that they've thrown in the trash. So we literally dumpster dive to get cardboard tubes. And then the other thing we do is we recycle probably 90% of our water in our process because we do have to wash the alpaca. But the uh, chemical processes that we use are very environmentally friendly. The, we basically are washing off knitting oils with a soap that's no different than Dawn liquid. We use a little bit of softener as a lubricant and you know, it's just so simple. So we don't have any air emissions. We don't have any problematic or toxic effluent. Everything is it's non-toxic, environmentally friendly, and we plan on keeping the operation that way. Those are all things that we built in from the start. Yeah, and thanks for sharing all of that information. I think that's good for people to know that those are not standard practices in the textile industry, and it is important to be on the lookout for brands that are doing that. So if people want to learn more about the Appalachian Gear Company and your practices, where can they find you? Um, AppalachianGearCompany.com and you can also just Google App Gear Co. A-P-P-G-E-A-R-C-O hoodie and it'll get you to the website. And we've got a lot of interesting blogs and okay. I've done some videos so people can see what I look like and it's very unimpressive. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and I can tell you that I always tell people I just kind of hate having to be the face of the company because I, I don't have a face for a video. But, but anyway, yeah, we'd appreciate more people knowing about us. Yeah, and I'll share the website link in the episode notes so you can find it easily down there. Okay. Um, and do you have any social media at this point in time? Yeah, at Gearco is our Instagram, A-P-P-G-E-A-R-C-O. And I get just Appalachian Gear Company on Facebook. 
cool. I'll share those in the episode notes as well. And this was a really great conversation. I learned a lot, and so I hope everyone else enjoyed it. But thank you for taking the time to chat with me today. Well, thanks. And I, I know I ramble, but there's just so much information after all these decades. And so if you have any other podcast that are going to concentrate on the environment and some of these other issues, please call me because I'd love to participate. Oh, sure thing. I really enjoyed my conversation with John, and I hope you did too. I learned a lot about textiles, natural fibers, and I still have so many questions, but I feel like a lot got answered throughout our conversation. I'm really excited about all the work that the Appalachian Gear Company is doing and some of the new innovations and changes they are trying to make in the outdoor industry. If you want to hear more episodes about textiles specifically, then let me know. Leave a review and be sure to subscribe so you never miss an episode. You can also contact me on Instagram at outdoor.minimalist.book. Follow there for daily updates. Feel free to DM me any questions or episode ideas you may have. Tune in for other educational resources and to help build an outdoor community with a shared goal to create a better outdoor space as we recreate.